Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton and this is episode 13 of my Bayonetta Let's Play. So I'm going to go through that door and start a cutscene in a moment. Actually it's the cutscene after the fight that I want to talk about so I'm just going to jump right in. So... What are you boys doing in here? Are you hiding something from me? Come on. So periodically there are these cutscenes where she just goes absolutely, you know, absolutely sicko mode on a bunch of... Just a bunch of the weakest angels in the game. Well, I guess they're not the weakest, there are the, the flying ones that are weaker, but, you know, the most basic enemy type in the entire game. And it's kind of like, yeah, at this point, you can destroy them, we, you know she can destroy them, so why are you bother making you fight a whole bunch of them when, you know... You're just going to destroy them easily and score a perfect platinum instead. You've been cheating on me, haven't you? Someone else caught your eye? Bayo, why do you know about cheating? Why is this a conception that you have? Oh dear. I mean, she's an amnesiac. Something tells me I'm going to regret this. So yeah, cutscenes like this are there to just remind us that, yeah, no, she has zero effort taking out the weak guys, but again, why does she have a conception of what cheating is? Where does she get all this stuff from? She was an amnesiac until 20 years ago, and she spent... I'm not normally one to play saviour, but I suppose I can make an exception and kill all of you. Just this once, of course. Uh, yeah, she spent all of that time... Um fighting angels every single day. Well, that's what we were told earlier, that she has to, you know, fight them every day or be dragged down to hell. So, I, excuse me? Explain? Like, where, do you, where does she find the time, is what I'm asking. So, this fight's notable because it is the first fight where um, we can't see Bayonetta and we can't see the angels. What I assume that means is essentially that this is from the kid's point of view, although obviously it's still from our camera zooming around that follows Bayonetta. So this actually confused me a fair bit originally because, um, well, we've seen in cutscenes and so on that uh, when Bayonetta is in Purgatorio, uh, she can interact with, you know, she can't interact with anything that is, um, you know, this kind of invisible ghostly shape that is in one of the other realms. Oh wow, I'm really getting beaten up, huh? Can I... let me dodge, let me get my... Okay, well, I guess I lost that combo multiplier for nothing. Let's go! Anyway, back to what I was saying, which was that... God, what was I saying? Um... I'm still recovering from my bad fatigue flare-ups, so I'm not firing on all cylinders, but I'm still doing better than I was before. Certainly better than my previous attempts to record these episodes. But, yeah, um... Anyway, so she's not in... We're seeing the human world, and she is in Purgatorio fighting the angels in Purgatorio, which is why they're kicking the shit out of each other, but we can't see either of them. There's that late motif again. Was I just singing? Mommy! Whoa, whoa, whoa. Slow down, little one. I am not your mother. But, Mommy... Will you quit calling me Mommy? <laughs> oh. If there's two things I hate in this world, it's cockroaches and crying babies. Well, a crying baby cockroach would be truly terrible. So don't you dare cry. Yes, Mommy. 
mommy? Fine. You've got to be a strong little one to survive in a place like this. What's your name, anyway? Cereza. Cereza? You're not from Figrid, are you, little one? Where are you from? Uh, I'm from my house. Well, now, I'll hazard a guess this isn't your home. So what on earth are you doing here? My daddy told me to come here. And whereabouts is this daddy of yours? He was at work, but now I don't know where he's gone. I want to go home. <sighs> I can't just drag you along wherever I go, little one. So you'd better not be getting attached to me. Yes, mommy? Ugh. Come now, little one. I'll help you out of here, but that's all. No. And you have to promise there'll be no crying. A single tear and you'll be crying alone. Got it? Okay, mommy. Ugh. So, I actually have loads to say about that cutscene, and the first thing I want to say is I love the way she says, Daddy. But, um, that aside, I just want to say that... <sighs> okay, I want to take a second and just stand here, so please don't get bored and go away, because I think it's really interesting. But that entire cutscene is, if you forget about the camera movement, shot in a really interesting way. It's framed in a really interesting way. It actually borrows a huge amount from um, stage productions. It is almost entirely um, shot as if it were filming a stage production. The two figures always stay facing one another or tilt to Bayonetta's right towards the audience, towards an audience that isn't there. Sim similarly, um, both characters have exaggerated body language, which matches the way that stage artists are taught to perform body language, which is very large and expansive because, well, you know, an audience is further away than in film or TV, so they need to be able to see what you're doing. Similarly, um, so she always tilts outwards towards the player, uh, or towards the invisible um, audience that isn't there, you know, the fourth wall, if you will. Um, and I think that's really interesting because it also ties into the way that the two of them act and behave, which is this very back and forth stagey style of um, interaction. Um, like she even makes an aside to to the audience at one point or almost does or she dis disguises it. Um, and it's interesting how conspicuously stagey that is and how how noticeable it is. And I have no idea if any of that is intentional, but I do think it's quite, quite fascinating. Um, so yeah, that's most of what I want to say about that cutscene. Basically that it's really curious to me that if you ignore the way the camera zooms around, the two of them maintain this plane opposite each other, and they both only ever turn to Bayonetta's right, only ever turn towards the audience, exactly the way blocking is established on a stage. Um, and I, I mean, this might be crediting the director with too much, but he's quite a good director, so... Perhaps that is intended to reinforce the camp undertones of the of the thing as a whole. Perhaps that is intended to reinforce the kind of highly performative, stagey ridiculousness of this whole situation. Is that the case? I do not know. But I do think it's interesting and fun to think about this stuff. So, yeah, if you're still here, let's move straight on. First, there is an Antonio's ledger. The faith of Laguna and the development of Vigrid. And that's someone honking their horn really noisily outside my flat. In recent days, Vigrid has seen the rise of the Ithavol group, a conglomerate whose rapid development has changed the face of the city. Their man-made island off the coast of Vigrid, Isla del Sol, is a clear example of their technological style. It is a modern metropolis home to many residents. However, their flight from the old city has led to the onshore historical district's rapid decline, a process that will likely end in the areas becoming ruins free of inhabitants. That's a interesting take on gentrification, huh? Those who live on the Isla del Sol and those who have remained in the old city all worship the Laguna, gods who are the heart of the faith. In many ways, like sun worship, this faith has been at the people's court since ancient times and forms the very heart of their cultural development. It is said the Ithaval group itself was developed in conjunction with the Laguna. 
and that its CEO is held up as a paragon of Laguna worship, the living symbol of the people's faith. He is purported to be descended from the said-to-be-annihilated Lumen sages, although I cannot confirm the veracity of this claim. At any rate, the devotion which people hold towards the Ithaval group is without question. Vigrid's appearance is not the only part of the city to have changed completely. The ancient faith in the Laguna is now inexorably linked to the Ithaval group as it pushes forward its modernizations. Thus, the city has lost its previous visage, to be replaced at alarming speed and with all the apparent consent of the Laguna worshipping Vigridians. So, I wonder if it's some kind of a satirical thematic point that this place has a religion whose, you know, religious head, whose, um, you know, Pope equivalent is in fact a CEO. But if they are trying to make some kind of a point with it, I don't know what it is. Now, in this combat, it's interesting because you are actually unable to attack those uh, angels with your, your, you know, your various weapons and guns and things. You have to use this lamppost, and specifically this lamppost. That's because, uh, for whatever reason, she won't put the kid in that protective wizard bubble. Protective wizard bubble is a good phrase. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with that. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> uh, what was I saying? Right, the kid. So be that means she has to fight them while she's in the human world. She can see them because she's a witch, but she can't interact with them because they are in Purgatorio and she is in human world. So that means that you have to wail on them with physical objects, which, as we'll discover later, exist in all three dimensions simultaneously. Which raises a lot of interesting questions about how physics works, but anyway... I just want to point out that it's a nice detail that even the dumpsters have lagoon and writing on them instead of whatever, you know, Latin text you would have in in this place otherwise. Um, so I'm coughing a fair bit because I'm still recovering, of course, so hopefully I'll edit all of those out, but if I miss any, please don't hate me. So in this section, only damage applied to you matters for your... Uh, well, I beefed that up, huh? Only damage done to Bayonetta matters for your score. Which means that uh, as long as you keep moving forwards and keep throwing stuff at him to keep him off, uh, off the, the baby, Cereza was her name, you can pretty easily get through this section. I got perfect platinum on my practice, but uh, I'm not doing it now. Because he hit me well, twice now. But yeah, so basically you just need to focus on protecting yourself and stopping him from actually breaking your barrier down. Which isn't massively difficult, but I seem to be screwing it up anyway. But yeah, so this is yet another... Uh, well, it's a yet another escort quest in the long tradition of video games having escort quests and everybody hating them. It's honestly quite irritating, this one. Um, the kid falls over, you have to smash gates down for her. It's possible to delay the beloved fast enough that he can't really keep up with her, and um, if you do that then you can get perfect platinum pretty easily, but I did not do that. So I'm going to run around smashing all of these because I want to gather up some uh, resources, and then I'm going to go check out the shop. Because I think we have a new... Do we have a new... Do we have a new... Do we have a new weapon yet? I don't think we do, actually. I think we have two-thirds of a new weapon. I wonder if you're supposed to start sprinting at these um, birds at this point using your panther form. That might be the way to catch them. Anyway, let's read this. Purgatorio, centre of the Trinity. One of the unique aspects of the religion in this town is the people's belief that the world is made up of three unique realms layered on top of each other, human world, inferno, and paradiso, the trinity of realities. However, the wavelengths of the spirit energy in each of these realities is different, and inhabitants of each are unable to interfere with one another's affairs, despite the fact that the worlds are layered. It's said that the Lumen Sages and the Umbra Witches had the unique ability to pass into a realm known as Purgatorio, and to travel amongst the trinity. It is believed that the witches and sages each made contracts with the masters of the light and dark worlds and can use special abilities granted to them by their masters. Underlying all of this, though, is the presence of the trinity of realities. Even during the witch hunts, it seems that those suspected of being witches were lured into Purgatorio, an act the people call being spirited away, and their presence in the no-man's land was used as justification for further acts of persecution. 
To further explain Purgatorio, one must understand that those within the realm are unable to see or touch those in the human world, nor are humans in their own world able to intervene in the affairs of Purgatorio. Moreover, what we identify as material objects may have different appearances in different realities. When these items are destroyed in one world, they are destroyed in all worlds. This may explain why many place religious interpretations on the phenomenon of unexplained destruction that occurs during their everyday lives. So, first off, my question is, does that mean that if someone creates a new object, it moves around in the other reality? Does that mean that if I picked up this bench and moved it six feet over here, an angel, you know, seeing the angel version of a bench, whatever that would be, a cloud, I suppose, sees a, a cloud just float up and move over six feet for some for no reason? And if that's the case, does that mean the human world is like the core reality that the others are judged from? Or does changing anything in any reality change all of the other realities? In which case, People must be used to just stuff flying around all of the time with no explanation. They do make it clear that stuff getting smashed all of the time with no explanation is definitely a thing. So, yeah, anyway, I'm going to go to the shop. Also, there's a lot of particle effects in this level, and the fact that this is a console port is pretty clear because it's all a bit chuggy. Check this out. What are you buying? Yeah, I've heard it in this game like three times now. So I am actually going to pick up a new technique here, which is the Bat Within. So it's really difficult to get this uh, to happen during the uh, practice mode here, but hopefully I'll be able to show it off. So essentially what this does is it adds a smaller secondary dodge window immediately after your dodge window or, well, immediately after you get hit. So, if you mistime your dodge, and instead of dodging, you get hit, but you press the dodge button, ex you know, exactly in the second you get hit, you know, it's, it's like a couple of fr frames window, I think. It's really, really short. There we go. Um, then what happens is that instead of taking the hit, you actually... Um, uh, you turn into bats for a split second, and um, exactly like dodging, instead of being hit, you don't take the damage, you don't take the magic build-up loss, um, and you do go into witch time. So, while it's a separate mechanic, in effect, what it does is extend your dodge window slightly. It means that if you hit dodge too late, instead of being hit, you are not hit instead. And that's just really useful. <laughs> to begin with. Mommy. Don't worry. It's always scary the first time you see them. So, where was I? Oh, yes. Your kind invitation. I do hope you've prepared dessert as well. It's very generous of her to wipe out the weak ones so that I only need to fight the uh, really tough ones when this cutscene is finished. Kind of reinforces what I was saying earlier. In cutscenes she takes out all the weak ones and then I have to fight the real ones. Oh, what a lovely tea party. And dancing, too. Cereza, my dear, watch and learn. Did she just pistol whip that kid? So, uh, I think it's, um, actually, I'm gonna point something out here real quick, or at least I will in a moment. I can just beat this guy to, uh, pulp. So, it's actually kind of inconvenient, uh, the, uh, what is it called? The, the panther form, because it uses the same button as the dodge mechanic and uh, that means that frequently instead of dodging I will in fact find myself turning into a panther which may not be a problem for some of you but is a problem for me when I'm trying to avoid getting hit by you know these guys ah there we go that's what I wanted 
So, for reasons that will become obvious shortly, I want to point out that the uh, the torture devices we've seen so far with the torture attacks, you know, they're called torture attacks because they're torture devices, right? No, those are universally execution mechanisms. Um, everything we've seen so far that's been called a torture attack is in fact an execution um, tool. We've seen a guillotine, we've seen... Um, you know, a hanging apparatus. We've seen an Iron Maiden, which, you know, Iron Maidens were never really used for that. They're, uh, they're a later invention. But um, that wheel that you use on the the big... What are they called? Um, those those griffin enemies that I just fought. The, that wheel is, in fact, a medieval execution mechanism, which is the breaking wheel, where you are chained to that wheel and rolled down a hill until you are... You know, destroyed, basically. So, while they're called torture attacks, they're not torture. They're execution. And, um, while, you know, she has the BDSM influences, and while, of course, there is a tradition of using execution apparatus as set dressing in kind of BDSM settings, especially with Iron Maidens, actually. Also, this little sequence here is... I'm assuming a riff on um, King Kong. Like, I don't I don't know what else this could mean. I'm sure that this is another one of the game's inexplicable references. You know, we've had plenty to almost everything. So here we have... Um, huh. For once, that wasn't the end of a cutscene that then required me to dodge in the split second after the cutscene. Nice of it to be slightly more magnanimous. Anyway. This guy is interesting because he doesn't look any different th than the other Beloveds we've fought in the past. But um, he has a different moveset. He has two additional attacks. which uh, One of which is to summon a whole bunch of flaming meteors that if you hide behind him will hurt him instead of you. And the other one is just a kind of a big slam attack. Not that slam attack, a different one. So, oh there we go. That vertical slam attack. Oh, he hit me. How rude. So, yeah, I was talking about um, BDSM and set dressing. So, I think that it's interesting. Like, all of these things are called torture attacks, but they aren't. They are execution, and they use execution mechanisms. And this bespeaks something that will become very relevant in a minute. Ah, twas beauty slayed the beast. Or maybe it was that dragon. Or I guess technically it was me for summoning the dragon. You know, cause and effect is complicated. I love the way that sequence is shot. So, uh, yeah, and this is just a straight up chase. You need to catch up. And, um... If you uh, don't do it right, you will, in fact, have to start over. So you can dodge through these, but not the ones on the ground. Um, only the high up ones, the ones that are not... Okay. <clears throat> so fortunately, I managed to keep up. If you fail, uh, then this cutscene goes differently. She doesn't get shot, she just floats up through the ceiling and Bayonetta watches her go. Meaningful wink. So this is interesting as well because what they're doing here is basically just competitive voguing. And voguing very, very definitely is something that came out of the um, gay subculture of New York in the 70s and the 80s. The, the dance hall culture. And... I don't know, where did that, you know, where did that, like, you know, end up here? How did that come in to something that's so Japanese, or at least was made in Japan with Japanese design sensibilities? Does that interact with, and I'm going to use an item real quick. Actually, I have three of these. Hmm. I still don't know which of those is better to end up using if you have to use one. Anyway, um... 
so yeah, I don't know for sure what, um, you know, what conception of camp or what inspirations this game had in those aspects. I did actually try to research this, but I had a lot of trouble. Um, uh, so yeah, um, this is slightly more troubling. So this is the first feminine angel design we've seen. All of the previous ones are either outright monstrous or masculine. And obviously physical body doesn't reflect gender or sex necessarily, but you know, in terms of how something is presented or intended to be read in an art in an artistic medium, you just you kind of have to bear in mind um, that that's how that works. Now, with a bit of luck, I will successfully build up enough um, of the uh, build up enough magic gauge, and I was very very close there to <laughs> so to speak. In fact, I'm going to let her. Oh no, that's not what she summons. Okay. So, uh, it's not going to happen, unfortunately. It's going to have to wait until next episode. But, um, you know what? I'm going to talk about it right now because uh, I don't want to forget to. So, those are the the first feminine angel designs, as opposed to the masculine angel designs or, mon or outright monstrous angel designs that we've seen previously. Those angel designs all have... Well, first off, they aren't sexualized. Bayonetta is extremely sexualized. Jean is not. They're the two primary female characters in this game. Bayonetta's sexualization, as I've talked about before, I think is genuinely empowering, rather than, you know, being for the benefit of the male gaze or whatever. Um, that's G-A-Z-E, in case you're wondering. Anyway, um... However, it kind of undercuts all of the kind of... the goodwill they've built up. The fact that... Here we have the first example of something that is feminine, that is not Bayonetta or, or Jean. And it's incredibly sexualized. It's intentionally highly sexualized. And that's supposed to be an, a mirror to Bayonetta. However, the fact that um, it's kind of for humor to some extent, whereas Bayonetta's sexuality isn't really for humor. It's just fundamental to who she is. I don't really like that. And... Um, I'll read this in a second. As will become clear next episode, I think, probably, provided I manage to actually get a recording of it and not screw up and lose my magic gauge, the torture attack applied to those characters, the Joy Angels, is not, in fact, um, an execution apparatus, like every other thing we fought so far. Theirs is genuinely a torture app apparatus. Specifically, it's a hobby horse. Um, which is an apparatus used in BDSM scenes as an apparatus of sexualized torture. You know, sexual sexualized torture. And, um, yeah, I don't think that's, I don't think that's okay, really. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm fine with sexualized torture in a BDSM context, don't get me wrong. But I think that the first female enemy in the game, being the only one who actually gets a sexualized torture, instead of just being executed... I think that's questionable, and I think that bespeaks something of the design team. I think that that, you know, reflects this kind of, like, non-queer, um, male-dominated design culture or whatever. And, um, to be honest, it's worse than just the fact that her execution is via a sexual torture. She literally writhes, screams, and explodes. You know, she screams orgasmically as she explodes into blood and guts all over the place. It's... I don't know, it feels gross in a way that nothing else in this game does. Is it crashing? Oh my god, is this game crashing? Okay, yeah, that was crashing. Fortunately, I can continue from my checkpoint. Um, I can only conclude that my hot takes were in fact so hot that the, uh, I don't know, the game overheated and melted and got destroyed. Um, something like that. But yeah, so fortunately I can pick up from where we left off thanks to the magic of editing. And uh, I'm pretty sure I said everything I was trying to say, possibly at too much length. So let's jump into this Antonia's notebook. The Angel's Banquet Hall, Alfheim. Oh, hey, of course. So there was in fact one previous mention of Norse mythology before the mention of the Ithavor group. 
because Alfheim obviously is the the realm that the elves come from in uh, in Nordic mythology. Anyway, Vigrid has long held the notion that the world is comprised of a trinity of realities: Paradiso, Inferno, and the human world. However, since the era of the witch hunts where the Umbra witches met total annihilation, Vigridians have held that Paradiso, the world of light, is the most perfect of these realms and have worshipped it as such. Yet, as normal human beings are unable to experience this heaven, the Vigridians' feelings regarding Paradiso manifest themselves in various ways. Even the Porta del Paradiso, ruins of which remain to this day, were born of this faith and placed around the city as an act of Paradiso worship. These structures, stone discs three meters in diameter, were said to represent portals into Paradiso itself. It was believed that when the gods extended the people a helping hand, they did so via the portals, guiding them to Paradiso. Thus the portal were placed in spiritually powerful locations. I have one more interesting aside. With pa within Paradiso, there are said to be secret rooms known as the Alfheim, where angels gather to hold their banquets. The Porta del Paradiso created by man is said to mimic the entrances to these Alfheim. Legend has it that if someone were to stumble across one of these portals while in Purgatorio, they may enter an Alfheim upon which the angels would entertain the lost visitor and bless them justly. So, I'd like to think that that's a little tongue-in-cheek reference to the fact that you get a combat challenge when you go there, because obviously Bayonetta herself... Um... Actually, there's a thought. So, the portal that I came in through was surrounded in the human world by benches and things. Notice that there's no benches here. So, does that mean that... Um... Purgatorio is in fact only a reflection of the human world, and uh, Paradiso and Inferno are less accurate reflections, without the detail of every single physical object, but the rough, vague sense of structures remaining. Anyway, that is an aside that was not what I meant to talk about uh, after reading that, and I can't remember what was. Oh dear. So... Uh... I guess you can just teleport if you want to. Here's a few more of these armed guards. It's interesting that, generally speaking, signs of the witches have been destroyed and signs of the sages have remained, but these two statues clearly reference the witches and the sages, with the sun on one side and the moon on the other. Um, I think it's curious that they're both here when there is the not both elsewhere. What was that? Aha, there we go. And, of course, over here we have the mannequin piss, which is a very famous statue in Europe in real life. I forget exactly which city it is that is famous for the mannequin piss, but um, a cherub pissing is apparently good for something, I guess. As part of the Ithaval group's plans for the further development of Vigrid, the man-made island of Isla del Sol, a new urban centre, was constructed and outfitted with a new highway, stretching a total of 41 kilometres or 26 miles. As expected, travelling this highway, which links the major, major areas of Vigrid to the island, requires vigorous checks, and its usefulness is limited to the Vigridian authorities, Ithaval Group materials transports, and a select group of authorised personnel. The bridge connecting the island to the mainland is an enormous overseas suspension bridge. The structures supporting the bridge's wires were shaped like the bright solar flares that shoot out from the sun's surface, giving the crossing its name, Prominence Bridge. It is truly a symbol of the modernity that has come to Vigrid. I assume that these ledgers were written like decades or maybe a century ago that these were ancient uh well not ancient records but you know old records also um at all of these different uh signboards in the different levels they do in fact have different appearances on them there's not just a generic city map or something there is a map of the area you're in or a picture of the area you're in as you can see we're in the uh, near the airbase so there's a picture of the airbase it's just a neat little detail that they it's nice that they included such extensive detail Time for a cutscene. Mummy! Mummy? You're a mom? You? Come now, Cheshire. Look at me. Do I look like I have any interest in children? Now making them. Well, that's another story. Whoa, whoa! You're getting the wrong idea. I mean, it might be the right idea, but not right now right, right? 
I quite enjoy the uh, contrast yeah, between uh, Luca's general right, insecurity and Bayonetta's, you know, unambiguous sexual confidence. I knew we'd cross paths. See, the only way to reach the upper crust in their gated island of champagne wishes and caviar dreams is over Prominence Bridge. Oh, yes, the island. Lovely place, isn't it? Oh, now what? Don't play games with me. You've worked your magic on this poor defenseless child, haven't you? You're a sad, sick woman, you know that? I was her age when you killed my father. Wait. No. You couldn't. Oh my god, you did, didn't you? You killed her parents! Hmm. Come to think of it, she's better off with you. You two are more hassle than you're worth. What? Just keep a good eye on her, or you're going to catch hell for it. No good deed goes unpunished, and you never know when a monster may sneak up on you. Mummy, look out! Now what's he spider manning onto? There's nothing here. How can she see me? It's the same problem you get in all the Spider-Man comics when he goes to Queens and it's like there's not a building over two stories in this entire neighborhood. How did you get around? Now this is probably silver. Oh, no, gold. Okay. I'll definitely take gold on a level where I skipped a combat challenge, definitely. And yeah, so hopefully I managed to talk about everything I wanted to talk about. And there is, of course, the bonus game that I always forget about. But um, with a bit of luck, next, uh, not next level, the level after, I'll be able to show off that, um, what I meant about that, uh, what is it called? The torture attack for the Joy Angels. Because, um... The next level is going to be a boss battle, but after that one, there's going to be a, as far as I can tell, a unique level in the game's structure. Which... Oh, hey! Huh. Okay. I've actually got three red hot shots. Do I... Is it even worth... I'll just take another one. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Um. Anyway, there's a fairly unique level in the game's structure coming up episode after next, and hopefully, with a bit of luck, I'll be able to show off exactly what I mean. Um... You know, whether you're interested in seeing what that is for, you know, critical analysis purposes or because you just want to see an angel get sexually tortured, that's fine too. That's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Anyway, that's all from me for today. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and there's links to my other projects in the description. Thank you so much for watching.